Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's safe to say that we live in uncertain times, especially now more than ever. I'm going to show you how you can build a device that powers a generator or a car or any kind of internal combustion engine using nothing more than wood scraps, paper, coal, whatever you can burn that's organic. And that device is called a wood gasifier. This one is a little bit different design than one you may have seen previously on my channel. That was a downdraft gasifier. This is an entirely new version called a crossdraft gasifier. Most importantly, in an effort to make these wood gasifiers and the knowledge of how to build them more accessible to people who probably need them most, for example, those that are off-grid or those who want to build one of these in a world where electricity may not be available. Again, this is just a preparation mindset, no implications, but if you're here watching this video, I think you know what I mean. But anyway, in the interest of, again, of making this more accessible, this unit was built with nothing more than an angle grinder and a hand drill and parts that I can find lying around, and so can you. So I hope you find this video interesting, I hope you learned something, and I hope this may give you some food for thought. So enjoy the video. Okay, whether you buy the pressure pot new or used, the first thing you'll want to do is burn it out and also burn out the uh, container inside as well. In my case, this unit was well used, so I need to make sure all the old residue and old paint is gone and out of it so it doesn't affect my system. And even if it's new, there'll be finishes that you need to get off. Because when you're running this as a gasifier, if you haven't done this, all of that crap will burn off with the heat and it'll end up uh, running through your gasifier system and into your engine or whatever it is that you're running. So I thought the simplest way to make sure that everything was perfectly clean was just to burn it out. Okay, so this is the lid of the pressure pot. Next up, everything on top needs to go and be sealed off with either a plug or even a simple bolt will do. While we're here, go ahead and remove this rubber gasket. We'll be replacing it with a high temperature fiberglass one later on. All right, so I now have five holes in the top of this that need to be filled, and the way I'm going to do that, rather than spend money on brass plugs, is simple 3 8 inch bolts. Washer on top, washer on the bottom, and some sealer in between. This is Permatex 80335. And the reason why we're going with it is because it resists temperatures up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is even more than orange RTV. So, I've sanded down all of these points to bare metal just on the top. I'm going to go ahead and seal everything, and then just sandwich those washers uh, with this in the middle. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so I'm going to set this aside, and while it's drying, I'm going to work on a base for this thing. Now, it's, now it is going to be a little bit more difficult without a welder to put a frame together, but it's really not going to be that complicated. So right now, all I'm going to shoot for is a square that I can mount this to, and then mount everything else to around that. All right, so now we have to stand for our soon-to-be gasifier reactor, and I came across an interesting problem. So first off, this is going to be a completely different kind of gasifier from the one that you may have seen previously on the channel, or even that you may have seen other places online. And if you're not familiar with gasifiers at all, I will explain it in detail 
or if you want to now, go ahead and check out my other video to get a detailed explanation on what these things are and how they work. But again, this one is going to be quite a bit different. It's what's called a cross-draft gasifier. So I'll put on screen now a diagram of what a cross-draft gasifier reactor actually looks like, and they're terribly simple, which is why I've chosen to go with it for this no-weld design. But you'll notice there is an air in on this side, and there is a gas out on this side. And while ordinarily with a welding project, that wouldn't be too terribly difficult, but because this is a curved surface, getting a pipe through here, maintaining structural integrity and a good seal would be terribly difficult while still making it look good, of course. <laughs> what I've decided to do is because all of that matters is that you have uh, an intake of air from the outside on one side and then an out uh, of gas on the other, a draw, if you will, which will go to the filter, which we'll get to later. But I can imitate those positions pretty easily by going through the smooth sided bottom. Let me show you what that looks like. So this diagram might be a little difficult to understand. It's a little bit messy, but I think it gets the point across. Essentially, we're going to be going through the bottom. And again, because we can't weld, but we need airtight seals and also structural integrity, I'm gonna be using one and a quarter inch pipe flanges on both the top and the bottom. And in between, there'll be a simple hole cut in the bottom of the pressure pot. And so where the gasification happens inside of this type of reactor is right here in the middle. You can see we have a grate that encompasses the bottom and also up the side where there's a small graded capsule for the gas out. So we have air in here, the reaction happens around here, and then ash gets sifted to the bottom. So this is a passive shaker grate. This is why these are really only typical for vehicles or a device where the generator is mounted on the gas fire unit frame as well, so the vibrations can shake all the old ash down. The nice part about these is that they can achieve very high temperatures, and the higher the temperature, the less uh, contaminants you have in the gas, and also the more effective the gasification, the more efficient, rather because you have all the insulation around it of the other biomass. The reaction is actually happening right in the middle of this pot with all the fuel around it. So this will be our only air in. Reaction happens here. The grate filters the ash, and then we have our gas out. And this will be, again, surrounded by a grate, which will act like the burn shaker grate in the downdraft gas fire design. And then the draw, because we don't want crap falling down to the top of this, we want a graded system as well here just to keep ash from going up our pipeline. And I'm just going to do that by drilling some holes in the pipe and then capping off the end. And we want to make sure to end those holes further up than from where the ash might accumulate. So this whole grate will be removable. And to clean it in between operations, you'll just remove the lid, pop the grate out. It'll be resting on these hopefully angle iron brackets attached to the side, and then you'll just scoop out the remnants. And we will be doing some experiments because this is only a five gallon reactor, it's a small scale, but they do offer 10 gallon paint pressure pots. So this could easily be upscaled and even converted into a downdraft design. If you simply add a fire tube to the top, a shaker grate here suspended from chains from the lid and a fuel hopper on top of that, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> anyway, so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to get each flange and each pipe as close to the opposite edge as we can, bolt them in place with some more of that high temp sealer, and I'll come back if I have any updates. Okay, so I have everything dry fitted together and you can see we have a slight problem. I'm not sure if the concavity in the bottom of this pressure pot is the result of years of usage and pressure or whether it's designed to be that way. But either way, it's causing us a problem because it's bringing these two closer together than they should be. And I don't want to mess with the bottom of this pot. So I'm going to take a simple route and I'm going to bend each one of these six inch by one and a quarter inch pipe nibbles.
Now because I couldn't just weld these back together, here's what I did. I just took a slight pie cut out of the bottom of the pipe, leaving a one inch wide piece in the back for support. Then I used some more of that handy dandy muffler sealant, and I made a bracket, pop riveted it in place with some steel pop rivets, and that's really about it. All right, so now that these pipes are done, I'm gonna go ahead and drill the holes in the sides of this like you saw in the diagram for my gas out, and nothing will need to be changed for this. And then we can move on to the great insert that the fuel will actually sit on and burn on. And for that, now every pressure pot should have one of these. It's just a can basically that sits inside of your pressure pot, and this is what you actually put the paint in so you can remove it and clean it a lot easier than that. But it's stainless steel, which means it's perfect for resisting the temperatures and the corrosiveness of the gas that we'll be putting it through. All right, so we have our gas suction tube, and then we have our air inlet tube. And I thought I'd take this moment just to share my great plan. So the grate will sit about two to two and a half inches off the bottom of the pot, and there will be a hole cut out to slip this over. So this will have a 90 degree elbow on the top, but that'll just be hand tightened every time. And when we need to remove the grate to clean out the ash from underneath, we'll simply unscrew it, remove it, and lift the grate out. So what I may have to do is oversize the hole and then add a small flashing that we can slip over the top, essentially like a washer, but we'll worry about that later. I guess I didn't really need to explain, I just wanted to use my pun. Okay, so here's the plan. We're gonna take our pot. We know it needs to be four inches away from this wall here. We're going to take the closed sided bottom. And also that four inch measurement is just from uh, this being equidistant from the center of the pipe to the, towards the inside to the center of the pipe towards the outside. So we're gonna take our pot here. We're gonna take our ruler, place it right where we want it. Then we're going to bring this four inches over and center it approximately over that pipe. It doesn't need to be perfect. I'm going to mark both sides where it intersects and also we're going to trace the outside of the pot along the bottom of the inner pot. Then it should be left with something like this. And now I need to know that the piece that we need to make is five inches tall and that'll put it just above this. It doesn't really need to be any higher just to make room for as much fuel as possible and since the intake is on the side of this we don't need to worry about obstructing the top. So you can see what we've done here. Now, now I have a square and I'm going to make a straight line down to that five inch mark that we just discovered. And you'll repeat that on both sides. And here's where it gets interesting. We're going to run a mark from that five inch mark, from this five inch mark, all across here using a tape measure. And now we need to make another mark an inch down on either side, another line across, and that will be our cut line. What we'll be doing with this material here is using it to cut ears to attach to our rest of our grate, which you'll see in a minute. And again, this is the line that we'll be cutting on here and also cutting along here. And so we can get all the cutting done at once, go ahead and take your tape measure and your ruler. And you're going to want to put a mark all the way around one inch up and then cut along that as well. So you're left with the bottom pan with this sort of crescent moon shape out of it. So I think you guys can take it from here. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out.
All right, so this piece is almost done, but obviously it's not a grate yet. It's just a solid piece of metal. So what we have to do is now drill a grid of holes in basically every surface that you can. There's no need to go way out here. If you come maybe inch and a half in from the sides and then everything all the way up to this upright and then on the upright and even on top. So basically, basically everything. I like to do smaller and more. So I'm gonna be using a quarter inch drill bit for this. I found that that works well. And that also keeps the hole small enough that I can use something like wood pellets if I wanted to, which is usually what I use for testing these. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. So like I briefly mentioned earlier, we needed to remove this gasket inside of this because it's not going to be rated for the kind of heat that we're going to be putting this under. So to replace that rubber, I'll be using fiberglass rope. And this is just replacement gasketing that you can find at most hardware stores for wood stoves. Again, withstands temperatures up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it fits perfectly into the gap around here. And to secure it in place, we'll be using gasketing cement and stove sealer, which is basically just glue that's made for this exact purpose. So I'm gonna lay a bead in the bottom of this and then put my rope in place. So with that gasket in place, now our reactor is basically done. A couple more things I'm going to do, but for all intents and purposes, we are complete. So now we have our gas out here, which I'm bringing this way because I don't want the filter elements to be on the same side as where the majority of the heat's going to be. So you'll have a lot of insulation on the sides because there'll be fuel there. So that is where we're going to want to put most of our workings to keep it cool as possible, which is really the main goal because we have our gas produced, but we need to make sure it's clean enough for our engine so we don't destroy it. And that is where this cooling and filtering system that I'm about to show you comes into place. First thing we're going to do is try to get as much heat out as we can so we can condense it, bring those molecules closer together, and then get all the tar and steam to condense back into their liquid form. And for that, why not use something that's already designed to radiate heat from the inside. Uh, this is an old oil heater, one that I found for free in the junk pile, and I think it'll work perfectly because it already has one and a quarter inch pipe threads in both sides for the heating element, and I have a hunch that underneath this will be the exact same size bung. So these are full of diathermic oil, which is basically just some kind of uh, highly refined mineral oil, so you can dispose of that properly, however you deem fit, as long as it's responsible. And there's really not a whole lot of hazard to using these. So I'm gonna take my grinder, I'm gonna grind down the top of this ridge, and with any luck, there'll be threads down there too. So we have our reactor, we have our condenser down here, and we're gonna put one more filter unit on here to get the gas as clean as possible. And for that, you're going to need a five gallon metal bucket, specifically one, the metal lid, and some sort of locking hasp. This one is just a hoop. So we're going to be attaching this flange to the bottom of the bucket, and then we'll be filling this with media. And this will be upside down, and that filter media, which will most likely be something like wood shavings or some other fibrous media that'll trap any sort of particulates and hopefully get uh, more tar out of the gas because that's really, again, our main enemy before it gets to the engine. And we'll be attaching this to the bottom of the bucket, drilling a hole the exact same way we did in our reactor. And that is using our sealant and some 3 8 inch bolts. Okay, I'm realizing that we have a lot still to cover and not a lot of time to do it with how long this video is already getting and I still need to test this thing. So really quick, I'm going to do a recap or a quick sum up. We have a reactor, which you saw how to build, which is piped into our cooler, which is going to get as much heat out as possible, which is why it's in this orientation here to hopefully allow heat to go up and out and not uh, up through the top of here like it would be in a standard oil heater orientation. I'm trying to get rid of it as readily as possible. And then out of that, we have just a simple pipe going into a bucket. In that bucket will be filled some medium that filters out any contaminants, or at least as many contaminants as we can. Over there, we have an air inlet, which goes into the other side. Again, you saw to build a reactor, and I'll put a butterfly valve on that. And I'm gonna do some framework to put it all together, but I think you have all the mechanical workings down. Whew. Except for one last thing. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm going to do this, and then we're gonna move on to the testing phase. So when this is up and running, the vacuum being pulled by the downstroke of the engine, ugh, hold on is enough to pull air from there all the way through the system, pulling gas with it, keeping that combustion going, cooling it down, filtering it, and bringing it to the engine. 
But in the meantime, we have to have a startup to get that gas up to the point where it can burn, which means that our reactor needs to be up to temperature. So to do that, we actually have a blower that we're going to attach to this to take the place of the engine in the interim, and that is going to attach straight to the top of this bucket. This needs to be removable because we will be having to change the filter medium whenever it gets dirty, essentially. So this is the last step I'll be taking you guys along with. So for the blower motor for this, I'm going to be using this blower here, which is actually from a vehicle and a specific vehicle. This is from a 1997 Toyota RAV4. You want to go with something that's 12 volt, so you can run this when power may not be available, hence the point. If I needed 120 volts to start my gas fire to create 120 volts, that's a catch-22. But the reason why I'm going with this specific fan is because these 1997 Toyota RAV4 fans fit perfectly into a number 10 can. <laughs> So I'm actually going to construct the blower as follows. This is going to sit right in the center of the top. I'm gonna to cut a hole just big enough so it can suck air in. And then on the side of this can, which I'll cut down just deep enough for the top of this fan not to hit the top of the bucket. And then out of the side, I'll use another tin can. I'll solder this all together, and that includes soldering the can to the top of the lid. But you wanna make sure that all of your paints and finishes are off of all of your items before you try soldering it, and make sure to use a plenty of soldering flux to make sure that you get good seal because again, keeping air out of our system where we don't want it is very important. And I'll explain all that in a bit if it doesn't make sense quite yet. Again, I apologize, but I think showing the building process and then having the actual unit uh, completed to go over will help you to better understand this in the long run. So you're gonna need a fan, you're gonna need a number 10 can, and you're gonna need a soup can. That's really about it. Okay, so the blower is mounted. The soldering isn't perfect, but it'll definitely hold. And I will be putting a brace here to hold onto that hose, uh, which will be running to our generator or whatever engine we're running, because obviously that's not gonna be strong enough to hold onto all that wiggle. So, blower motor fits perfectly down into there, pulls up through the media, and this is an important point because things will still be condensing from the reactor at this point. So having it mounted in an upward position where all of that can drain back into the media that can be replaced is something to take note of. And also I lifted it up a little bit. It'll keep this out of the way uh, of the hasp. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time for this project. So I did end up borrowing uh, the blower from my oil furnace. So anyway, if this looks different from the one you just saw me working on, that's why it's still all soldered together. And every one of these parts is a tin can. So the rest is basically just bracing and framework. And I will be putting a spigot on this radiator as well because this will be our main sort of condensate catcher especially since it's downstream from both things uh, so we'll have tar creosote and water building up in this that'll need to be taken care of i'm going to get that done and then you'll see it in the final product when i go over the whole explanation and that is really the gasifier now i just hope it works <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the gas fire is done and we're just getting set up to test and I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to walk you through how the entire process works while this thing is completed. So if you haven't seen my other video on wood gasification and even the word gas fire is completely new to you, allow me to explain. These devices are taking advantage of a process called gasification in which you can take any kind of organic biomass, really anything natural that burns, and by heating it up, you're able to break it down through a process called pyrolysis to its basic elements. When you do that, you create a gas called syngas or wood gas or synthesis gas or whatever you want to call it. And the gas is about 20% hydrogen, 20% carbon monoxide, 50 to 60% nitrogen, and the rest is just remaining methane. So again, that's whenever you heat up biomass above, I believe it's about 451 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the way we're taking advantage of that here is by burning material, but not completely. So we're burning it in an oxygen deprived environment, and that flame, the ignition of some of the material, is enough to create heat. And that heat, which is sustained through just enough oxygen to not spread to ignite the gases produced by the heat interacting with the surrounding material, is the process that we're using to create wood gas. But basically, small flame, heating around it but not giving enough oxygen to burn, and then those gases are then taken through this grate and then filtered through our system. Because in a perfect world, those gases would be completely clean, but unfortunately they contain things like water vapor from moisture content in the wood. The process also creates tars and creosote and some other nasty stuff that we need to filter out. And the main concern of getting that gas to be clean enough to run an engine is by cooling it down. And so underneath of this removable stainless steel grate, there's a pipe, as you saw, that runs down and then through this repurposed radiator, which the specific purpose of a radiator is to transfer heat from whatever's inside to whatever's outside. 
aka the air. <laughs> so we're taking advantage of that by piping hot gas through this radiator where it'll cool down. Most of that crap, the liquid stuff that's in vapor form because of the heat, will be condensed out. And then we'll move into the bottom of this bucket, which you just saw me fill with sawdust. And that'll act as a further filter media to get any particulates, because this will be essentially smoke coming out of here too. And there's a lot of little things like suspended carbon that we need to get out. Again, we want this to be broken down to just the gases. And what we're really after is that hydrogen. So as I said, we don't want there to be enough oxygen to actually just burn all the material in there before we can extract the gases. And so what we're doing is we're limiting that extremely by the use of just this here. And this is a one-way valve, it's a skate valve. This doesn't need to be as long as it is, but unfortunately it's the only piece of three-quarter inch pipe that I had. But that one-way valve is important to prevent flashbacks and things, because if too much oxygen gets in there, then you'll mix up the stoichiometry, which is the air-fuel mixture, uh, and it can become flammable. If you keep the system sealed enough to where it's just gas, it won't have enough oxygen to combine into a combustible mix inside of this. So that's the gasifier. We're producing our gas in here by cramming this full of burning material and then sealing it up. Air goes in, burns, comes out filtered, yada yada, out the end of this hose. And so this pipe will be connected first to a flare because we need to make sure that this is up to temperature and producing flammable gas before we risk putting it into our engine. It simply won't run it and it could damage it by building up tires and stuff. So I'll have a metal pipe on the end and we'll actually burn the gas coming out to make sure that it's burning nice and clean before hooking it up. <laughs> really? We actually need to pre-carburate the fuel before it leads into our engine, and I had a way I was going to do that using this valve here and my air intake, but it didn't end up working. So this is the traditional way that you would mix the gas in the air to get it to run in your generator. Inside of that gas fire, like I said, you do not want any stray oxygen, and so when it gets to here, there's not enough for it to combust inside of the engine. So what you have to do is you have to mix in the proper amount by hand by using a valve setup just like this. And at this point, the gas is cool enough that you can use PVC pipe and valves because it's cheaper and you won't have any issues with melting. So all you need to do is add a method of inputting your gas air mixture into your air intake. Specifically, if you can, on the outside of the air filter to add one final step of filtration before it gets into your engine. This generator and this engine did not have an air cleaner cover, so I had to make one, uh, but in your case, you won't need to. And I did weld that, so full disclosure. But just to prove, I did solder this one inch fitting into this. Just to get my point across, this is again a no weld project. Okay, so we've loaded the reactor with wood and I've put some starter down in there. Uh, which is just some cloth, some paper, and I sprinkled some wood pellets on top just to give it something small to start off with. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pack this up with about as much as we can fit with leaving a spot in the center. I'm going to turn that on, uh, the fan that is, and then we're going to ignite the center material. We're going to make sure that this tube is facing a safe direction so that we don't have gas going anywhere we don't want it. <laughs> Wire is getting connected. I'm not going to screw it down yet in case we have to reignite it, but I'm going to let this sit for a minute until we have smoke coming out of our hose. All right, so this has been running for about 15 minutes. I can feel the outside of this starting to get warm, and the gas that's coming out is looking pretty good. I have the end of the hose stuck into this metal pipe, so that way when I'm igniting the flare, it doesn't burn the end of the rubber. Simple as that. And we're going to go ahead and see if this ignites. Oh, yeah, yeah, already. Now this is still not a very, very clean flame. I can do better than this. I'm gonna let this get up to temperature and see if that goes away, but all that orange that you see, those are, con hold on. <laughs> all that orange that you saw, those were contaminants. And those contaminants, obviously they, uh, when heated, give off an orange glow. We are getting pretty dang close, but I'd like that flame to be a little bit cleaner. You'll notice this flame is actually burning a lot cleaner than the last time as well. I think we've gotten rid of a lot of the water vapor and other contaminants by basically pre-burning it and being left with just mostly charcoal this time. So I think we're ready to hook it up to the generator and see what happens.
So ladies and gentlemen, you've seen how to build it now. I hope you enjoyed this video. And one thing I forgot to mention, uh, last gasifier video, to shut down a gasifier, all you need to do is shut off the blower. Because the system has very little airflow and that flapper valve will close, this isn't going to get any air and it's going to die eventually. And then what you'll be left with is a nice bed of charcoal to start the next burn whenever you're ready to fire up your generator in the future. So for those of you out there who don't have a welder or maybe are already off grid but have access to some basic tools like this, I hope you were able to find inspiration from this. And if you did or if you have any questions, then please let me know in the comment section down below. So I hope I'm not forgetting anything, but I think that's about it. This information may be valuable soon, so share this information with your friends, download this video so you have it on hand, and if you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it, then don't forget to hit the like button, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.